thought there was a lisp. I'm sorry? <laughs> I thought there was a lisp. <laughs> the Heilige Chassam Seifer, Schissa Yuganalaini, has not been on this earth for over 170 years. And yet Europe, Romy, as very much a product of the 20th century, now the 21st century, have such powerful, powerful bonds to this great tzaddik and God will be his throat. How do you explain that? Coming from the city of the Hassam Sofer, it was not only me, every child and every person. Hassam Sofer was living in his soul, not only in his home. And this was every Jewish home in Pressburg. The Sofer was the root and the source of everything there was. Sai Mina, Sai Rishamayim, Sai Havas Abriyas, Havas Hashem. This was inrooted in such a way that this could not be uprooted. How did that manifest itself in daily life in Prejbarat? Well, it's, it's known, Pressburg was a city, was a Mokum Teure, one of the biggest yeshivas in Europe. Every stone and every street was full of Teure in Yerushalayim. And both that, there was an absolute mimus. Sincerity. And this was the key to the Rishamai. Could we have the next slide, please? What is this building? And this was the big shul, the main shul in Pressburg. Did the role of the city double there? Officially, the Rov doesn't in the Shishtim, which was the Yeshivas, which was the Yeshivas Samedrish. And then Shul, as the Rov of the city, of course, there were many Rabboni in Pressburg. There were approximately 30, 40 Shuls, and each Shul had a Rov. But the Rov, Pressburg Rov, which was the grandson of the Chalim Sofer, he was the official Rov. And his obligation was, a certain time, to officiate in the Shul such as the Shkhoidish Musaf, Yom Naruim, Yom Toivim, and that was the place where he had his droshes. It was part of his obligation as the roof of the city. In the Korn family home in which you grew up, how did the phenomenal Kesha to the Hassam Sofer manifest itself? I would say not any different than all the Mishpokas and all the families. Like I said before, this was the source, the root of every person was Hamsoifel's teaching. Could we have the next slide, please? What's this building? And this building shows the Shishtim, which was the Bissamedrish, where the roof was davening, and the, all the Balbatim, the Chachumim. This was the place where they, where they davened. Did you learn there? No, I was too young. Too young. In terms of your own practical development, how would you say the influence of the Hassam Seifer impressed itself on your personality and your character? Besides 
that Chaim Sofer, his spirit, was embedded, of course, in my father and mother. And they gave you all that chizuk. They showed you the way of life. And they gave you all the strength and chizuk in having betuch and all circumstances. And that accompanied you during the difficult days of the Shoah and beyond to this day. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, when you talk about the home in which you grew up, how would you describe or characterize that home? What were the key hallmarks of the home in which you were raised? The key was Torah, Gimnis Hasodim, Hachnos Orchim, Ahavas Hashem, Emunas Hashem, and Ahavas Abrius. You see, the city of Presburg was a city which we were not Hasidim, was today you call them Misnagdim, but this Misnagdim is the wrong word because they didn't oppose anything. Just contrary, they wanted, they accepted everything if it comes from Hasidim or what so-called modern orthodoxy, the all, the all those fractions, there were no difference at all. The same Mahave, the same Ahve, which we had, there was no such thing as this thing between one person and the other. Abbas Hashem was something which is above everything else. Tell us a little bit about the Haknosis Orchim that took place in your home. My parents, Baruch Hashem, they were well-to-do people, and they were wise enough how to use their wealth. We had a big house, which housed our family. But besides that, we had also a wing, which housed the Shiva Bukharam, which gave him board free of charge. We had another wing, which housed younger Bukharam from the Shiva Ketan. He got also free board. This was part of our house. So for our meals, regular meals, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, including Friday, there wasn't a meal which was served in the dining room or which had a guest which were ochen. Some of them were widows, more or less people, they had no home. They were steady orphan there, it's such a call, they called that Stammgast. They stayed with us every single day. And then there was no such meal we shouldn't have invited two yeshiva bochrem who were steady with us. They had steady ate every meal with us. And beside that, there was always some kind of orchem which passed by, which were invited. <coughs> so during the week, we're not talking about Shabbos, just a sim simple meal, we had around five, six people who joined us during our meals. And what about on Shabbosim? Shabbosim, Baruch Hashem, was, was a little different. We had our official dining room, which seated 20 people. We use it only on Shabbos. It was a custom, unfortunately, in Europe. There were many people without Parnosa. And what they had to do is they had to travel to the most western part of the country, where people are more affluent. And they wandered six months a year to just raise some money, to send some money back to the family. They should be able to sustain themselves. Those people, they were traveling, they were neglected. Pestburg was one of the cities which was very well visited. It was considered a city from Chesed and Sudoku. So in Shul, every Friday night after davening, was a custom that all those guests who wanted to be invited to a barbos, to the meals, there was a corridor, and they lined the corridor both sides. And each Balbos who went home took one or two orphan guests with him to the Shabbos table. My father, Oliver Sholem, he left the shul, the last one, when everyone was gone. 
Then he left the shul. And unfortunately, there were also, also certain orchem which were nobody wanted to take home. They were neglected in appearance. They didn't have showers and beds for a long time, so they had an odor. And those people, people rejected. My father, Ulf Asholem, took all those people who nobody wanted to take home. Those are the people he took home. Sometimes there were too many people, and we had only a limited place. So he had special tickets to the restaurant, which was open on Shabbat. Those people who couldn't take any more home, we gave them tickets there, in order to have a regular Shabbos meal. How did the household help react to these guests coming home every Friday night? Well, unfortunately, like I mentioned before, those people were neglected. And those are those people who nobody wanted to have at the table because for some of these reasons, not only that they had orders and the behavior was not exactly like we expected to have on the Shabbos table, but some of them, due to traveling and so on, they were infected with insects. And when they're sitting down, the chairs were upholstered. And after they left, the household, household help took those chairs, took them out on the yard, they had to clean them up from the lies which he left behind. So those are the ones only who complained about being those people in the house. My mother, Lord Shulam, never said a word. Years later, your father, Oliver Shalom, felt that the Rabbani Shalom repaid him for the particular type of Aplosis Orchim, which you have just described. Can you tell us that story? My father was in Mauthausen for the last, the remaining last few months of the, of the war. And everybody knows Mauthausen was a camp, you know, which very few, very few people survived. And my father tells me he was sitting on the yard and they saw the lice marching down on the floor. When they were sitting there, he saw that those lice was avoiding them, kept on going, and none of them, as many as they were, they all avoided him and didn't come close to him. <laughs> so my father said, this is in Schuss. I took people with lies into my house. <laughs> That's a beautiful story. Mita Keneged Mita. Tell us then, how would you summarize the key lessons you learned from your parents? The key lesson wasn't a lesson, it was an upbringing. The upbringing was either Shemayim, pure Shemayim, without any ingredients, without any salt. Ahava Sashem, Ahava. And this was something, the love to Hashem and the faith, the betoken Hashem. This was so strong. Nothing in this world could possibly shake it. You also learned something from the Hachnosas Orchim, which you applied later on, didn't you? When you, in fact, were instrumental in helping support families in the bitterest of days. It's not easy to talk about those days, that time. It's nice to listen, but when I have to remind myself and speak of those terrible days, it's not easy. We had just this week with Abtoyle Chazoy Nishayoi, and he says, Peza Chabiro Vimako. But the memories which brings, brings me back. Talking about those times is not very, not easy. It is not a scar, it's open wounds. 
which are as fresh they were in the time that would happen. And when you talk about it, it just awakens again those memories, and it's very, very painful. After the war, I used to get nightmares. Such a nightmares that in the morning I got up, the sheet was drenched with sweat, and the next day and the two days after, I wasn't able to function. So I said to myself, Kishbauch has saved you from the Nazis. They didn't be able to kill you. Or well, now you're going to kill yourself by letting yourself into those nightmares. You're going to be able to exist. So I made a promise to myself. I'll never talk about it. I'll never think about it. And I just wiped it out of my mind. I was approached many times by Yad Vashem, which is the organization which records the Holocaust happenings, because they had people give testimony, and my name came as a cross-reference. They were very eager to have an interview with me. I should give them, give them my story. I refused. After many years, again and again, they approached me. I still refused. When the Holocaust denials came out, when they said the Holocaust never happened, so I said to myself, no time to continue that luxury and forget about it, you have to speak up. And that time, I did give him a testimony, a video testimony. They, matter of fact, they made a transcript of this testimony and I published a book, which is out of the book, which is called The Youngest Partisan. And this is the book which is, which is published today by Art Scroll. At that time, all Jews were gone. In Pressburg, there were no more Jews left, with a few exceptions, where people were able to find a bunker by the Nazis, by the, by the, by the Gentiles who saved them from the Nazis. This was towards the end of the war. We figured, not a couple of weeks, not a month, the Russian front is proceeding, 